you who wants to turn to 340, hymn number 340, will you please stand? house tonight. I'm glad to see all of you here. Uh, glad to have everyone on Facebook with us, visiting with us. I do want to thank all of our uh, church members and our, our friends and everybody that watches and supports. It's um, a little bit different than what we're used to, but that's all right. God's made a provision for us to still preach and enjoy one another in the Lord. So let's do take advantage of what God has allowed us and given us the opportunities for we do want to uh, recognize some in need of prayer. We, we certainly want to pray for our country. We need to pray for the condition, the spiritual condition of our country. And we do want to pray for the physical condition of our country as well. We're dealing with a, a country that's uh, without a doubt what the Word of God would re uh, refer to as a perverse generation. We are in a, a, a situation or in a place right now where um, sin is, is called good and good is evil. So we, we find ourselves struggling as Christians today to deal with the things that we often face. But God is still on his throne. God is blessed. Amen. God, God has, has, is still saving. Um, and, and we need to keep moving. We need to keep moving forward for his honor and his glory. Remember, if you would, our country, we certainly won't pray for all of our leaders that uh, the Lord would um, somehow or another, just get a hold of them and, and uh, teach them and acknowledge to them the, the need for Jesus in their life. Um, we certainly want to remember our community as well as we try to encourage it, the community as we reach out through various means, phone calls, Facebook, and um, however it is that we can encourage others, we certainly want to do that. Remember the church. We, we do want to pray for the church and all that's going on right now. And remember our sick folks. Is there anyone we want to acknowledge in need of prayer at this time? Oh, no, I've been saying about that. I want to 
right. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Do so remember all of these if you would. And we certainly want to pray for um, all unspoken. I know that we all have something in our heart and on our mind that we're dealing with. Remember the loss uh, that we may be encouragement to them and a help to them to realize what they need in their life is Jesus. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Is there anyone else? Anything else? All right. Then. Let's go ahead and get started. I want to ask if you would turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We will continue with our study tonight on the armor of God. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6. I'll ask you if you would please stand in honor to the reading of the Word of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, we will read verse number 17. The Bible says, And take the helmet of the Spirit and the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now let us pray if you would. Father, we bow in the sweet name of Jesus and thank you, God, for allowing us this opportunity, Father, that you've given us tonight, that we may look to your Word. Teach us, Father, encourage us, motivate us. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would move and, and just have freedom tonight to, to move in all of our hearts and our minds as we look to your Word. Father, share with us what it is that we need, and, and Father, I pray that we would be receptive tonight to your word, God, and we would apply it as needed. Do bless all that's been mentioned in need of prayer. Bless those that's on the hearts and mind of all. Father, especially bless those that are lost. We pray, Father, that they would come to know Christ before it's everlasting too late. We bless these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now tonight, we want to continue to look at um, the, the armor of God right here. Uh, we've studied through here for several uh, weeks that we're to put on the whole armor of God. If we put on the armor of God, that's when we're going to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, is what verse 11 teaches us. But we notice there that we're to put on the whole armor. Everything that's offered to us by God, we're to take advantage and, and to put in our life and to use as he has appropriated it for us to be used. Tonight, we're going to look at the sword of the Spirit. Now, this is the sixth armor of God that's described here by Paul. We keep in mind, if you would, that Paul is on house arrest, and as he is in this condition, he's looking at this soldier, and he looks at the armor that the soldier is wearing, and looks at the, or, or thinks about the use of this armor, and then he'll make a spiritual application. The soldier's sword is, is just simply a sword. It's a defensive and offensive weapon used to protect, uh, fight, and defeat the enemy. Now, I want us to think about that. This, this is what the sword was commonly used for. It is just simply a, a mighty weapon in order to protect and fight and defeat the enemy. The Word of God is the Christian's weapon of war. So we find that God's Word serves the same purpose spiritually for us tonight as the soldier's sword serves for them in their um, time of battle. So let's take a look at the Word of God tonight and try to apply it as, as best as we can and understand the uses of God's Word, some thoughts um, I studied through this and prayed over it and um, got to thinking, um, how is it that we can really use this analogy and, and this um, illustration here to teach us about the Word of God and how we're to use it as a defensive and offensive uh, um, weapon in our, our spiritual life. As, as we go about dealing with different battles, we find ourselves sometimes up against the wall, not knowing what to do. And, and how to respond, but we understand that what Paul is trying to tell us is, first of all, the battle is a spiritual battle. A lot of times we try to uh, uh, fight the battles on our own when Paul is trying to identify the, the warfare in our life and these battles 
are spiritual of nature and we need that, that spiritual armor. We need that armor that only God can provide. So verse number six, or, or um, armor number six rather, is an armor that, that points to us with the effectiveness of the sword is the word of God. There's two things I want to consider tonight as we deal with the word of God as the Christian's weapon. There's a lot of thoughts in these two things that we're going to consider, so I'll try to uh, I'll point these things out and, and be brief with each, each thing that we'll look at and, and um, each scripture reference we'll look at um, and, and try to identify what we can, make the point, and move on. Um, first of all, I want us to understand the Holy Spirit's responsibility to the Word. Notice the, what Paul writes here in verse number 17. He says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So he identifies uh, uh, the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit. He associates the Spirit of God with the Word of God. There's three things as we see in the Word of God that shows the Holy Spirit's responsibility to the Word. And I believe this will be a blessing to us tonight if we'll take and understand these three things and allow it to, to teach us and to help us understand what we need tonight is we need God's Word, not another person's Word, not, a, not, not another teaching, not another uh, thought. What we need is we need God's Word speaking to us tonight to help us in our spiritual warfare. The first thing we want to look at is the Holy Spirit inspired the Word. Now we're looking at three things that, um, that points to the Holy Spirit's responsibility in the Word of God. So number one, if you would, in 2 Peter chapter number one, we look at the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God. 2 Peter chapter one will bring this to light for us tonight and help us to understand that, that the Holy Spirit is the inspiration behind the Word of God. If you would look here in verses 20 and 21, the Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now let's understand what Peter's writing here. He says, first of all, knowing this, this is what we need to know tonight. In order to be familiar with this with, with, with this weaponry, uh, let's stop and think about uh, a soldier's sword. As a soldier would, would, would take a sword, and, and before he would be comfortable enough to take it into battle with him, he would want to test the sword and become familiar with it. So understand tonight, we need to become familiar with the Word of God. And, and in being familiar with the Word of God, we need to see that the Holy Spirit inspired the Word. First of all, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. Do you see that tonight? Understand that, that, that there is no private interpretation, that this Word is not a Word that's given to anyone else to change or to recreate or to re-instruct uh, um, in any way. He says, for the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of men, uh, man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we see in verse 21 that this word came not by the will of man. You know, this word is given to us as God willed it for us. Let me try to explain that. As God saw necessary for us, what it is that we need, God penned his word through hope these holy men. Through these men as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit and they wrote down the word of God and they preserved, the Holy Spirit preserved it for us and today we have it before us. We preach, we teach, we, we study and, and it benefits us in many ways. But understand the, the relationship of the Spirit here is that he inspired the word of God. He inspired the men, the men of God to, to be moved, that word moved means to lead or drive. He drove them, he led them to pen the very word as we have it today, as God would have it to be. I want you to understand tonight 
that, that it's necessary to understand the involvement of the Holy Spirit of God with the Word of God. Understand, number one, the inspiration, but understand, number two, that the Holy Spirit illuminates the Word. He, he brings the Word of God to life. He allows the, or, or brings it um, uh, uh, to a point of understanding and receiving in a person's life. John 16, if you turn to the Gospel of John chapter 16, we see here that the Holy Spirit of God is used by God to do this very thing. As Peter, or, or um, Jesus, was, was dealing with the uh, uh, disciples here, and he would go on to tell them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, he said in verse number 13, he says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall he will show you things to come. So first of all, we'll understand the relationship is our responsibility is that the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God. But secondly, the Holy Spirit illuminates the Word of God. Now look at these two words in verse number 13. We find the word guide. When he, the Holy Spirit here, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. So as he guides us into the, the different areas, avenues of life, as he is a tour guide, guide if you would, as he is one that will take us in life and, and point things out and allow us to know and to understand certain things, he is without a doubt the one to guide us in the things of God and in the word of God. But he says, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So he will guide us as a tour guide, but he will show us as a tour guide would take an uh, individual around and show them the things of, of, of interest, and, and, and he will also show them or teach them the things, make things known to them, point certain things out uh, to them in their life. And this is of great importance about the, the matter of the responsibility of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And the third thing we want to see as far as the responsibilities is, is simply this. The Holy Spirit preserves the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit inspires, illuminates, and He preserves the Word of God. In the book of Psalms in chapter number 12, as we see here in the Psalms number 12, the psalmist would write this pertaining to the Word of God. And, and, and this is something of a great interest. He says here in verses 6 and 7, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. He says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now let's notice here that that, that Holy Spirit of God that's inspired the Word of God, that illuminates the Word of God, is also the one that preserves the Word of God. But notice he says here in the latter part of verse number 7, He will preserve them from this generation forever. Now, now these three things, here. These responsibilities of the Holy Spirit dealing with the Word of God teaches us some great truths that we need to hold on to when we're dealing with this spiritual warfare. As a Christian today, we, we find ourselves fighting many battles. We find ourselves as a not, not only offensive, but in a defensive situation where we might have to defend our faith, or we might have to defend our, our feelings and our emotions, and we certainly need to turn our attention to God's Word. But understanding this, it's the Holy Spirit of God that is responsible for the Word of God. Now as we receive this truth, we understand that it's the Holy Spirit that works in us. The Holy Spirit will deliver the Word of God in us to show us. He will show us that the Word of God is inspired. He'll show us the inspiration behind God's Word. He'll show us that men were moved by the Holy Spirit of God, that God Himself get put it in the heart. He put it in the mind uh, of men of God that was under the will of God to pin everything down that we need tonight. And he um, has brought it to a point of perfection. He's brought it to a point of completion as he's seen fit. He's not only inspired, but he, he illuminates the Word of God. He teaches us and he shows us the things of God. He helps us to understand the Word of God. And number three, He preserves the Word of God. Understand this, church. This is God's Word. It's 
This is the very word of God, and it is without a doubt settled. He said from this generation forever, he said that it is forever settled. It will not change. It cannot change. Not only is it settled, but it is unchangeable. God's word is unchangeable. Why would we try to change the word of God? Answer me that. Why is it that we think we, we, we have more intelligence, we have more knowledge, we have more capabilities that we want to change the Word of God? Doesn't the Bible say it is settled? It is settled. It is over. It is done. Why do we want to be the ones? I hate to have to stand in judgment and be one that, that is, is accused and brought up in the judgment for changing God's Word. Do, do you know that? I would be, uh, I would hate to know that I, myself, was, was guilty of changing the Word of God. Let me tell you the difference between a version and a commentary. A commentary comments, it's a man commenting on the Word of God. A version of the Bible is a man changing the Word of God. There's a big difference between the two. And it's settled. God's Word is settled. He's preserved it. He's, he's settled it. He's, he's kept it for us throughout the ages and dispensations. And He's given it to us in and, and, and every way that we need it to be. How can a person claim that there's error in God's Word but yet trust it in salvation? How is it that, that a person themselves would think that they need to change the words around me and that they need to, to make it a, a little more presentable or, or that they need to redirect the attention that it's given in certain areas of life. How is it that we feel like we are capable and responsible for doing those things? Understand tonight, church, that the Holy Spirit of God holds the responsibility to be the one that inspired the Word, that illuminates the Word, and He also preserves the Word of God. It's not our place to change God's Word. Yeah. We should never try to yeah. change it. We should just accept it. Yeah. So the first thing we want to look at tonight it's just simply this. The Holy Spirit's responsibility to the Word of God. Now the second thing we want to look at is the effect of the Word of God. As a Christian, we need to know the effect of God's Word. The same as a soldier would need to know the use and the operation of a sword and the effect that it had so that he could trust it and in his, his battle and, and in the war that he's fighting, he has to familiarize himself with it. So we need to understand, number one, God's Word is, is spiritually, is inspired by the Spirit of God. It's illuminated by the Spirit of God. And it's preserved. But here I want to show you tonight the effect of the Word of God. There's six things want to share with you tonight. And I want, to, uh, I want to help you understand tonight how God's Word can help you. How it can be a, effective in, in your Christian walk and in the things that you deal with, the, the battles that you might face. I just simply want to try to help you tonight to understand these things. Understand, number one, the effect of the Word of God is it convicts. In Hebrews chapter 4, I want you to turn there, and we're going to look here in verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. I, I want us to see here that the Word of God convicts. Notice what the Bible says. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let's notice what the Bible says. The Word of God. Now we're talking about God's Word. This is how quick and powerful and sharp that it is. Now it, it, it's showing the effect that it has on an individual. It, it's showing here that, that it don't play games. This, this Word is quick. God's Word don't beat around the bush. It, it just gets directly into the point. And it shows us the things that we need to see. But it's powerful. It's got power. It, it'll change us. God's Word will change us and change who we are in our life. But it's sharp. It don't leave any jagged edges. It just cuts. And it cuts deep. And that's what he's talking about. 
that said. That, that, that's the only way, that's the only remedy of sin, which is Jesus Christ. So let's go back to the first thought we had tonight, that the Holy Spirit's responsibility to the Word is not only to inspire the Word, not only to make the Word of God known, but to eliminate, eliminate the Word, to show, to prove the Word in a person's life. You know, the Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. A lot of people today think that they've got it all figured out. They think that they understand the Word of God and they, they put little verses in their mind and, and, and they'll get their own uh, justification for that verse and then their own excuse or whatever it is they're dealing with. And listen to me, they'll get rid of that conviction real quick and they'll push that to the side. And, and, and as they keep coming to church, the Word of God will pull, uh, will pull and tug on them and it'll cut them deep and it'll expose the, 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 the wounds of sin in their life. And what they'll do is put a band-aid on it. And oh, I got this one figured out. I'm going to go on in my life and live how I want to. And they'll go on. And eventually they'll stop coming to church because of the effect the Word of God has in their life. And, and that's, that's where a lot of folks are today. And, and don't take this personal. Just, just take this as the truth. Because that's how God's Word works in our life. You cannot know God without conviction, church. You cannot be saved without Holy Spirit conviction. Amen. Yeah. It can't happen. Yeah. All you're going to do is make a, a mess of things. You know, I, I really think a lot of folks today, they just all of a sudden decide they want to be a Christian because of the benefits that it has with them. I think about Constantine when he decided to be a Christian. And he saw, uh, he, he supposedly saw, um, as I understand, a fiery red cross in the sky with the inscription, By this thou shalt conquer. So therefore he thought that if he became a Christian, that he would conquer the world. He put himself in that place, in that category, as a, as a Christian. He didn't do it by conviction. He did it by his own will, uh, thinking that he was going to benefit from something. And out of that, we find the Roman Catholic Church. And through that, we find a uh, slaughter of the church during the Dark Ages. But nevertheless, understand this. You, you just got to see that the Word of God says that, that it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces, it pierces to the divine asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that's why a lot of people don't like it. They like it as long as it fits what they want it to stand for. But when it brings conviction and it cuts deep into their heart and it opens them up and shows them they got sin, they try to close that old wound, put a band-aid on it, and they go. Folks, I want you to know something. This book is alive. It's God's word. It's not my word, not your word. This book is alive and it brings conviction. But number two, I want you to know this. Not only does it bring conviction, but it saves. Amen. It saves. If you'll listen to this word and you'll surrender to this conviction, you'll find salvation. In Romans chapter 1, I want you to read here with me as Paul writes here to, to the Romans in chapter 1 and verse number 16. Notice the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of this word. I'm not ashamed of it at all. Why? Because it's the power, it's the mean, it's the authority of God of salvation. If you're not saved according to this book right here, you're not saved. The Bible says you must be born again. Amen. You must be born again. The very writer of this book right here thought he was okay with God. He was religious. He was dedicated to his religion. He was dedicated to what he believed in so much that he persecuted the church like many are today. Man, 
persecute the church further. But then all of a sudden, God got a hold of him. He fell to his face. He fell to the ground. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? I want you to know Saul, for once in his life, finally realized there was somebody of authority besides himself. One day, a lot of lost people are going to realize that, but it's going to be too late. Church, you understand, you're not the authority in your life, Jesus Christ is. Yeah. He put Saul flat on his face. I'm talking about a man that was religious. I'm talking about a man that was faithful. I'm talking about a man that was true and sincere to what he believed, to his religion. We remember the, 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 the rich young ruler and as he would be proudful, lifted up in pride. All that he'd done from his youth up was, in the, uh, was right in the eyes of God. And he, he went to Jesus and, and he was boastful about this. And he said, what like I yet? And he said, give up some things in your life and follow me and he walked away sorry. There's a lot of people that's got religion in that church and, and they, there's just some things they will not give up. When that conviction comes, they walk away sorrowful. You remember how he didn't want to give some things up and he didn't want to surrender his life to Jesus Christ. Oh, how many people are in that boat today. They're, they are religious. They do have a belief. Nicodemus came to Jesus. He said, I believe. He believed in God. He believed Jesus will, will come from God. But what did Jesus tell him? Jesus said, you must be born again. You can believe. The devils believe and tremble. They tremble. Just because you believe in Jesus don't mean that you're saved. If you believe in Jesus, you believe you must be born again. And you surrender your life to Jesus for his saving grace. You must believe in your heart unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Amen. You must repent, the Bible says. So we see that the, the word of God it saves. It is the power of God and the salvation. The third thing we see, not only does it convict, not only does it save, but the Word of God reveals. Right here in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 17, the Bible says, For therein, meaning in the Word of God, in the, in, in the gospel, he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, just shall live by faith. Now, now, notice what he says right here. What does it reveal? It reveals our faith. The Word of God reveals to us how to be right with God. There are so many today that believe they're right with God and they're far from being right with God. And it all starts because they don't surrender to conviction. If you go back in John chapter 16 and you see that Jesus says it's, it's necessary, it's expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will come. He, he, he says that he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The first conviction you'll see in your life and feel is the sin in your life. And it's a separation between you and God. Then righteousness, you need to be made right. Because if you're not, you're going to face God in judgment. What a sad day it is for many people as they walk through this earth and, and they feel like they're all right with God. They believe in something. They believe in, 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 in a, a religion. They believe in, in a, 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 a belief. They believe in something, but ultimately they're going to die and go to hell. And they're going to go to hell because they never surrendered to conviction and got saved. They didn't base their faith off of the word of God. He said therein in the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. The 
just, those that are justified in the eyes of God are justified by the grace of God. It's only the grace of God. It's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that justifies us in God's eyes. There's nothing just or righteous in my life outside of Jesus. In his, his saving grace. Yeah. His sustaining grace. Oh, what a great Savior we have tonight. That we can say I'm justified not by myself or my works or or, or things that I've done, but it's by the grace of Jesus Christ that I have assurance of salvation. Amen. And that's the faith that's revealed to me in the Word of God. That's the faith that I'm to trust and to understand as, as I walk with the Lord and as I, I, I build relations with God. That's the faith that I have. The just, the Bible says, shall live by faith. So the third thing is, the Word of God, it reveals to us, it reveals faith, righteous faith, godly faith. The fourth thing we want to look at tonight, the Word of God teaches us. The Word of God teaches us. In Romans chapter 15, if you would look there with me quickly tonight, we see that God's Word teaches us. In verse number 4 of Romans chapter 15, the Bible says, For whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now notice what he's saying. He's directing back to the Word of God and it says this is what the Word of God does for us that we may learn. And what are we going to learn? That as we are patient, and as we draw comfort from the Word of God, we've got to be patient, church. We've got to study the Word of God. We've got to apply to um, our, our attention and, and, and to the Word of God and study. He says through patience and comfort. I'm glad to know that I can find comfort in the Word of God. The Word of God says God is the God of all comfort. He's the God of all comfort. A lot of people today are seeking comfort in different avenues of their life. Remember, the Holy Spirit is our guide, and He will show us things. He will show us in these avenues that He takes us the things of God. One of them is comfort. That's where He's going to lead us. When we need comfort, we're going to go straight to the Word of God. And we're going to find that comfort. Because God is the God of all comfort. Amen. He says here not only does it deal with the matter of patience and comfort, but I like this last word he uses it. He says, of the scriptures might have hope. So through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. We've got hope in our life today. It don't matter what's going on in our life. It don't matter what kind of mud hole we're drug through. It don't matter what's, good, what's happened to us. It don't matter what it is we're to face tomorrow. We've got hope, and that hope lies within the Word of God. But I want you to understand something. If you don't let the Holy Spirit of God teach you about that hope and reveal that hope to you, you're not going to know about the hope that Jesus gives. I'm glad I got hope and salvation tonight. Amen. In the scriptures. I, I'm going to tell you, I can, I, I can pull out the, the word of God and, and we're talking about the way the word of God reveals to us the faith, the righteousness in faith. And, and I can show you what the word of God says. When I surrendered my life and was born again, I have the hope of eternal life. That when I die and I take my last breath, that there is no sting in death. I will go straight on from this life that I'm living. The Bible says that the angels will be there. And as they are there and, and I take my last breath, listen to me now, church. I love this. This is a hope that we have. The angels of God will be there. We'll take our last breath. The spirit, the soul will come out of the body. And the angels will carry us into the very prayer. 
old miserable world we're living in. Amen. Oh, we got a hope tonight. We got something to hope in. We've got something to motivate us in tonight. This whole world can't give you that kind of hope. This world can't motivate you in the things that, that, that God can, that this Word can. I want you to understand tonight, and let's see here tonight, the Word of God teaches us, and it teaches us we can learn of that hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Number five. It defends us. Now let's remember what we're dealing with tonight. Paul says that we're not fighting. He says we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting the old battle that a lot of people claim we're fighting. You see a lot, a lot of folks today are are fighting a, a physical battle, an emotional battle. But what Paul says, it goes far beyond that church. We're fighting a spiritual battle. And in order to defend ourselves and in order to win this battle, we've got to put on the, the armor of God. We've got to use everything that God has given us. This word defends us. I want you to look in Matthew chapter 4 for just a minute. I'll give you a minute to get there. I want you to see this. In Matthew chapter 4, we know the story of Jesus when the Holy Spirit led him up into the wilderness. The Bible says in verse number one, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You look at this, God knew exactly what was going on. Nothing catches God off guard. Eh? He says, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was after, afterward a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made of bread. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now here we find that Jesus was hungry. His, his flesh was hungry. And in verse number four, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Now there's three temptations here. And there's many ways that these three temptations have been labeled and, and taught. But there's three ways I want to point to, uh, three things I want to point to tonight. First of all, what we see in verse number four, three and four, is a physical need. You see, in this temptation, Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible identifies the hunger that he had. And as it is known that he was hungry, Satan came to him and he tempted him with something that, that he needed. He's hungry, so you need food to fill your belly, right? So this is a physical need. The physical need is often referred to and identified as the lust of the eye. Sometimes we are hungry. Sometimes we do have a need in our life. But when that tempter, when that old devil comes, when that influence comes. That don't mean that we just pounce on that. Maybe we need to sit down and think about it and pray about it a little while because the devil wants to use the hunger against us and turn it into something simple. Notice what the Bible says. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We need to hunger spiritually tonight. We need to have a spiritual hunger tonight to help us in our physical 
needs. There's a lot of people that no doubt would argue with that and they would say that, that, that we have physical needs and it would be justified but understand the, the story that's given to us is for Jesus to face the temptation as we find that there are times that it seems like we have a need that God's not meeting, and we'll just fall prey to the old devil. There's a lot of folks today that think the claim, the reason they don't have time for God is because they're providing for their family. I'm not going to get into that with anybody. But I'm glad Jesus had time to provide for me. Yeah, yeah. And to do what I needed him to do. What, what, what was necessary that I would be blessed. You see, Jesus did provide a need for us in this temptation. That is, a hunger for God's word. The word of God defended Jesus even in this time. Look at the second thing in verse number 6. Or five, the Bible says the devil taketh him up to the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now I want you to know there's a lot of temptations in the world today and a lot of people are, are trying to get gain uh, from those temptations and they're falling prey to them. What he's talking about is uh, Satan brought him to a point of looking down at everybody and said if you cast yourself down and then all of a sudden the angels of God would give you a soft landing then you will have performed some kind of miracle where everybody would look at you and praise you. Sometimes ambition stands in the way of worship and being right with God. Satan was tempting him with being ambitious. And sometimes that's the way we are today. We find ourselves wanting to work and to do and, and get a certain amount of gain in our life. And we just don't have time for God. We don't have time to do the things of God and surrender to, to the will of God. The physical desires is the lust of the flesh is what we see here. Many today have, have a physical desire. They desire to have more. They desire to have uh, uh, material things or material wealth. And all that is is the lust of the flesh. And instead of saying, get thee behind me, Satan, they're falling prey to him. They see that as a benefit or even a need. The third thing we see in verse number 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, This is something that we, we all need to understand tonight. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Amen. This hits home with a lot of folks today. This is a spiritual principle, which is dealing with the pride of life. A spiritual principle. I don't have time for God because I, I, I've, got, I've got a different God in my life. You heard me make reference to God has, through this virus, he's taken a lot of the little G's out of our life, shows that he's the big G. Those little gods, the sports and, and the casinos and the bars and Things like that. God shut them down to show us that he's the one in control. Amen. God's in control of our life. And, and we need to put him first. We need to surrender to him. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. 
There's two words right here. Number one is we need to worship God. We need to fall before God on our face. When Paul, Paul gave us a picture when he fell before the Lord, he was humbled in the sight of God. He couldn't stand in the sight of God. He fell before him, flat on his face. We see serve. Instead of serving the flesh and, and what we want, the desires, and just thinking that we're all right with God, church, we need to serve God tonight. Amen. We need to serve God. According to the Word of God, the Bible says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. There's a good, good principle right there. There's certain trials, there's certain temptations we're going to endure in our life, certain things we're going to go through. But when we use the Word of God and we fight through these things, when, when we get to a point to where we've proven or, 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 or we, we've done whatever it is that, that, that we need to do, then God is going to minister to us in one way or another. God takes care of His children. Amen. And if you're saved tonight, God's going to take care of you. That's one of the effects of the Word of God. That's one of the assurances that we have of the Word of God, that He will take care of us. The Word of God defends us. The last thing we want to look at, number six tonight, is the Word of God judges us. In Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. Now let's understand tonight. We've seen where the Holy Spirit's responsibility to the Word is three things. The Holy Spirit inspired the Word. He's in control of the Word. He illuminates the Word. He makes the Word of God known unto us. And He preserves the Word. The Word of God cannot be changed. And as we understand the work of the Spirit, we see the effect that God's Word has. It corrects or convicts us. It saves us. It reveals to us. It teaches us and defends us. But listen, church, it also judges us. And if you don't get anything out of tonight, you need to get this. Paul says, he's right here to the Romans in chapter 2 and verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. What Paul's saying is just simply this. God's going to judge man, the secrets of men, the things that people are not aware of, the things that people are not exposing. But God knows it all. He said he's going to judge those things according to to the very gospel that he preached according to the word of God in other words now I understand a lot of people today are running from God's word they don't like it they don't like the conviction they don't like the correction they don't like the exposure of the condition that they're in their sin and, and that they need to get right with God if they've got to change their life if they're going to die and go to hell they don't like all of that, so what they do is they'll run from that and they'll go find something else that, that, that teaches religion and, and, and makes them feel good about themselves and feel good about who they are. God don't accept us for who we are. The Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned in their life. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. It doesn't matter how good you try to be. It doesn't matter. You've still got sin in your life. The only righteousness in us is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So a lot, of, a lot of folks today don't understand and don't realize that God's Word is going to judge them. So in other words, everything they're running from, everything that has driven them away from God, the hurt feelings, if you want to call it that, the hurt feelings is truly conviction. The offense that they found in the preaching of God's Word, that offense is conviction. 
All those things that they're running from, all those justifications they've made, it will not stand in God's court. Amen. Because the righteousness of God is going to prevail. God is a just God. All judgment is handed to Jesus Christ and he will judge justly. The Bible says the books will be open. One of those books that will be open will be the word of God that we have today that teaches us the things of God and, and how we're to be right with God. This book will be open and the, the convictions of God that people ran from will be brought back to mind and, and God will reveal it to them and they'll say, do you remember when you ran from my word and the Holy Spirit of God was getting your attention, trying to get your attention, but you you ran and you, you made a false accusation or whatever it is uh, against somebody and, and said they're too hard or they're mean or, or they don't know what they're saying or whatever it might be. Listen to me church, the word of God is going to stand as a judge against people in that nature, Amen. in that condition. Amen. For all the good and the bad, the Bible says, is how we'll be judged. What a sad thought it is to know that there's going to be a lot of folks thought that they were saved. And they never surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. They never surrendered to him in salvation. They said that they were saved and maybe they were religious. They might have even said a prayer. I've talked to, to folks before that, that said, well, a preacher prayed for me or, or, or they, they said that they prayed. You know, the Bible says if you regard iniquity in your heart, God don't hear you. So in other words, you can pray all you want to, but if you're not sincere, God's not listening. And nothing is happening. In the Revelation in chapter 20, I want to show you the judgment that the lost people is going to stand in while we're on the subject of the Word of God judging those that are lost. The Word of God judges the saved, but it judges the lost too. And we know that the Bible says in Matthew 7 that there'll be many that'll stand before the Lord and they'll, they'll give an account and they'll say that God, we, we did these things for you and we, we did them in your name. We went to church and we did all these things. And he'll say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Could you imagine hearing the word from Jesus Christ? I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. What an awful day that's going to be. Amen. Verse 12 of the Revelation in chapter 20, the Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. In other words, as, as they felt that conviction and they got offended and they said, I don't like that old loud mouth preacher because he's wrong and, and he's, a, he, he's just a, a dictator and, and he don't know what he's talking about or whatever it might be. Folks, I want to tell you something. That's the Holy Spirit of God bringing conviction and trying to get somebody saved. But notice what the Bible says. Says, he sees them stand there, small and great, before God. The books were open. Here we find the books are open, the Word of God, the book of their life, and the book of life that provides a place where they could have been recorded but were not. He says the, the books, according to their works, in verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Notice the condition right here. Those souls that occupy hell right now, they'll be delivered up into this judgment. They'll be judged according to the life that they live. They'll be judged according to the, 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 the denial of Christ in their life, the times where they backed off of uh, the truth and walked away from the truth, the times that they made fun of, uh, of, the, of the church and of the preaching of the word of God, they would not surrender. They thought that they were okay. They thought that they were fine. They thought they were going to, uh, uh, to heaven. But they, the Bible 
says they'll be led up into this judgment. They'll stand there before the Lord Jesus and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. They were cast into the lake of fire. This is the very picture right here as they will stand before Jesus and they will be pronounced. I never knew. He'll say it. They'll cry out. We're talking about weeping and gnashing of teeth right here, church. Yeah. They'll cry out and they'll say, God, we went to church every now and then. We took our kids to Sunday school. We took our kids to Bible school. We just didn't like that preacher. He was judgmental and he didn't know what he was talking about. He read from that old King James Bible, that old uh, outdated book, the these and the thous I couldn't understand. I want to tell you something, church. It's not for our understanding. It's not a regular book you open up and you grab hold of, the natural man receives not the things of God. The Spirit of God has got to take that God and apply it in your heart. He's got to show you. He's got to teach you. He's got to guide you. He's got to guide you through those avenues of your life and show you that sin and open that word and expose the truth to you. But these that are not saved is going to say, God, I didn't have a chance. You know what he's going to say? Turn to the book of Romans chapter 1. You have no excuse. Amen. You have no excuse. <clears throat> Sunday was my family day, God. Man. Bring your family to church. Amen. What better family day can you have? Verse 15 of Revelation chapter 20 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This word cast right here. Understand the word. It means that they are forcibly thrown. They'll be hollered and they'll be screaming. That they'll, they'll holler for, for mercy. They'll holler for just mercy. God, you're a merciful God. You're a loving God. He's going to say, I can't do anything about it. You chose your own. You remember when you heard that message preached about hell? And the Holy Spirit stirred in your heart. The Holy Spirit got a hold of you and he said, look, you're not right according to the word of God. And you said, no, no, I'm all right. I got to pacify my feeling. This is just an emotion. I can't do this. Finally, you quit going to church because you didn't like what was preached. You didn't like the, that the Holy Spirit was working with you and the Holy Spirit was trying to open your eyes and, and help you to see you needed to be saved. You know, a person needs, people need to realize today, you cannot be saved, church, unless the Holy Spirit breaks you. Amen. The Holy Spirit's got to break you and show you the sin in your life. You've got to accept that sin. And accept the very fact that there's nothing you can do about sin of yourself. Nothing that you can do that would justify your righteousness. Only Jesus can. Amen. They'll be cast. The Bible says they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is people that's going to claim to, to have been in church. This is going to be people that claim to have done the work of God. This is going to be people that's going to say, God, I've got a just excuse and I've got a reason why I didn't do the things you wanted me to. He's going to say, I never knew you. And they're going to scream and they're going to holler and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Amen. For all eternity. For all eternity. What a sad thing. What a sad truth that is for me. The sword of the Spirit kind of got in a direction a little bit different than what I was intending on leaving. But you understand tonight, there's six things, six effects that God's Word has in our life. Now pay attention to them. It convicts. It saves. Through conviction comes salvation. It reveals. It reveals our faith. After a person is saved, the word of God will reveal the faith of God. Teach us about faith. It teaches us about the hope that we have. The hope we have is in Jesus. It's not in this world. 
eternal life is in Jesus. It defends us. It is written. That's all we got to say. Get behind me, you old devil. It's written in God's word. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. You get behind me. But folks, listen to me. The word of God judges. Amen. It will stand as the judge. At the judgment seat of Christ for the saved person. And it will stand as the judge. The judgment seat of Christ for the lost person. Amen. The sword of the spirit. We need to take the sword. That the Holy Spirit inspired. Illuminates and preserves. And apply the use of that sword, which is the effect that it has in my life. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate each one of you being here and each one of you listening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we bow again in the sweet name of Jesus and we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Father, for your truth and your absolution. Many more things, God, that we need to consider tonight. And about your word and, and Father about the work of the Spirit as the Holy Spirit is active in, in our life and, and showing us and teaching us the things of God. Father, I pray tonight that you bless the preaching of your word and God that somebody somewhere has just simply taken your word and fed from it. God, that it's just been a blessing to them. Father, do bless God. All that's been mentioned in need of prayer, bless any that might be lost. We pray that the lost would be saved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.